Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this late afternoon or evening, depending on where you're from, um, working with allies to bring Asian American history to schools. Our virtual discussion today will feature some wonderful speakers. We have Amit Kabrowski of the Oregon Department of Education. We have Kate Lee of the Asian American Education Project. Ke and Keisha Rembert from National Louis University, um, and she also was involved with many, many organizations. Um, I am your host today, Larissa Lam. I am the director and producer of Far East Deep South. Um, and later on, you will also meet my co-producer and subject of that documentary, Baldwin Chu. We're going to be launching a poll. Do your best to answer. We have three questions in our a API knowledge uh, poll here. Um, one is regarding Wang Kim Ark, one is regarding Dalip Sand, and one is regarding the Chinese in the Mississippi Delta. And here we go. Regarding Wang Kim Ark, only one person, that's 3%. <laughs> learned about him in school. I did not learn this, but my kids did. Um, I didn't, so 43% of the people of you here said, I didn't learn anything until I was an adult about him. And a whopping 54%, which is the majority, said Wong Kim Hu. And regarding Dalip Sand, um, only one person learned about him in school. No one has kids to their knowledge has learned about it. 35% said they didn't learn about, about him until they were an adult, and 62% said Dali Pu. Regarding the Chinese brought to the Mississippi Delta to be plantation labor in the 1800s, 5% um, said they learned about it in school, 0% said their kids learned about it, 35% said they didn't learn anything about it until they were an adult, 30% of them said they didn't learn anything about it until they watched our documentary, Far East Deep South. 5% here, hey, we got two, so far we got two Mississippians um, who are from the Mississippi Delta. My family is from there, or not my family, but I should say Baldwin's family is from there. Um, and then 24% of you have said, Chinese people in Mississippi, what happened there? Thank you all for participating in this. And these results are very telling to the topic of today of needing the need to bring more Asian American history. Don't worry, for those of you who don't know who Wong Kim Ark uh, or Dalip Sand is, um, one of our panelists will be giving you the answer in a little bit. Um, in the meantime, for those of you who did not know about the Chinese being brought to the Mississippi Delta as replacement labor for um, the plantation work, we're going to show you the trailer of our documentary, Far East Deep South, which is about the Chinese in the Mississippi Delta. Growing up, it was always kind of a mystery about my dad and his side of the family. Whenever my brother and I would ask him about my grandfather, he would just say, oh, it's a sad story, it's, it's not a big deal. One day we came across this photo of a gravestone, and that's when my dad finally told us that this is where my grandfather and great-grandfather were buried. But not in China, in Mississippi. Chinese people in Mississippi? What happened there? actually don't know where we are going and where we're going. Last thing I thought I'd ever find in Mississippi was a Chinese museum. I guess there was more than just my grandfather and my great-grandfather. When the Chinese first came to the Delta, they were treated like we were. Everything was very segregated. I mean, it was black, white. We were just really in the middle. I had to attend a segregated one-room schoolhouse. Growing up, I read about segregation, and I, I thought that it only affected the black community. I just didn't really think that it would happen to the Chinese, too. What? Great-grandpa! It is so important for people to know what happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act and how it affected Chinese Americans throughout the nation, including the South.
if you haven't had an opportunity to watch Far East Deep South, um, it is currently available on Canopy if you're with the University Systems. Um, it is also on PBS Passport. Um, and currently it's also playing at the Cinequest uh, Virtual Film Festival that just started today into uh, the November 14th. So um, we will drop some links later. Um, and if you had registered, I mean, if you've registered later on any resources that are shared today, we're actually going to be emailing to everybody. Thank you again for joining us. Um, we are so excited for this conversation about working with allies to bring Asian American history to schools. This is actually the second part of an ongoing series that we're doing um, that we have entitled Beyond Far East Deep South. Um, we made the documentary Far East Deep South um, mainly because Baldwin, um, my husband, whose family is featured in the film and you're going to meet in just a moment, um, I took a trip with their family to Mississippi to try to find the gravesite of his grandfather and great grandfather, thinking there would only be two Chinese men buried there. Little did I know that there was a whole population, um, generations, um, who had lived and died in the Mississippi Delta. Um, in fact, a couple people who are on this call um, are from the Mississippi Delta that are of Chinese descent, as well as we have someone on our panel um, who is of Af who is African American who has family from the Mississippi Delta and you know, growing up in school, I was a good student. I took AP history and nowhere did I learn about this history. Um, I had no idea, even though I'd learned about the American South, I'd learned about Jim Crow laws. I did not know that people that looked like me um, had um, a connection to that history. And so, you know, if we stop to think about it, like growing up, I didn't learn very much at all about Asian American history, which is why we're so passionate about, you know, having conversations like this and why we're so excited that there's been a movement and we have so many people and so many allies that are helping to try to push this narrative forward. Okay, um, so I'm going to bring on um, my co-conspirator here, uh, <laughs> Baldwin Chu. And um, he's going to also tell you a little bit, another little little known piece of history about one of the oldest, um, you know, advocacy groups in our country, Chinese Americans Alliance, Chinese American Citizens Alliance, which is one of our co-sponsors for today. Um, Baldwin, um, please let us know uh, more about Chinese American Citizens Alliance. I want to say thank you for our, everybody here to be here today. And um, we want to thank the uh, Chinese American Citizens Alliance, aka CACA. Uh, for co-hosting this event. Uh, just a little bit more about what CACA is about. They were founded in 1895 in San Francisco, and the Chinese American Citizen Alliance is the oldest Asian American advocacy group in the U.S. Uh, the alliance has fought against racial discrimination, defended civil rights, opposed anti-immigration movements, and countered efforts to marginalize American Chinese culture and heritage. Um, each of the chartered lodges across the U.S., there's about 20 of them, is dedicated to enhancing civic pride, supporting community services, uh, promoting sensible citizenship. And in fact, I am a member of the Los Angeles Lodge and Larissa is a member of the San Gabriel Valley Lodge. So thank you very much, CACA, for supporting all this. Um, and without further ado, um, I am going to be introducing our panel for today. Uh, we have first up Kate Lee, who is um, out in Connecticut uh, right now. And she is the program manager for the Asian American Edu Education Project and advocate for inclusive curriculum in K through 12 schools. Kate co-founded the Make Us Visible Coalition to include AAPI studies in the K through eight model curriculum for the state of Connecticut. After successfully passing legislation in Connecticut earlier this year, Make Us Visible has since expanded to several other states such as New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Georgia. In addition to 10 years of a teaching experience, Kate was a curriculum editor for the PBS Asian Americans docuseries. She also serves on the board of directors for the Immigrant History Initiative. Um, we are so delighted to have Kate here. And Kate gets the honor of helping to answer our poll questions for those of you who don't know who Wong Kim Ark and Dalip Sand are. Take it away, Kate. Thank you for that introduction, Larissa. So for those of you who don't recognize Wong Kim Ark, no worries. Um, I wasn't taught that in school. I learned it along the way and then realized how important it was for us to implement all this curriculum into schools because this is important stuff here. So a little bit about Wong Kim Ark. Um, he was born in San Francisco in 1873 and was denied re-entry into the United States after he had a trip abroad. Um, and so that was because of a law that restricted Chinese immigration and it prohibited 
immigrants from China um, from becoming naturalized U.S. citizens. And so he challenged the government's refusal, and this resulted in the Supreme Court ruling um, that determined the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted birthright citizenship to everyone born in the United States, regardless of your race or uh, nationality. So really cool tidbit. Um, and there's more if you want to learn more about it. That's also in um, one of the lesson plans for the Asian American Education Project. Go ahead. Tell us who Dalip Sand is. Cool. So Dalip Sand, Sand um, also known as Judge, his nickname, um, he was born in what is now known as Punjab, India, and he immigrated to the U.S. Uh, through Ellis Island um, to study at UC Berkeley. I believe he was there to study agriculture initially. Um, he uh, after uh, immigrating to the U.S., he campaigned for uh, people of South Asian descent to become naturalized citizens. Um, and then after he applied for naturalization and became an American citizen in 1949, um, he eventually uh, ran for office. And in his 1956 election, um, it was groundbreaking be because he broke several barriers. Um, he was not only the first Asian American, he was the first Indian American, the first Indian immigrant, the first Sikh American to be elected into Congress. Um, and so um, just a trailblazer in every single way. And I highly encourage everyone just to look up um, more about him. Thank you so much. So yes, this uh, we're talking about education, but hopefully we're also enhancing everyone's knowledge on API history today. Um, we'll hear more from Kate in, in a bit with the panel. Um, next up on our on our panel that I want to introduce is uh, Amit Kabrowski, who is the social science specialist from the Oregon Department of Education. And since joining that department, Amit has helped design and implement K through 12 ethnic studies, integrated social science standards on for all Oregon studies students. Amit is also helping to support teachers in addressing Holocaust and genocide studies and the social science portion of the tribal history shared history lessons. He is also part of the ODA team implementing Oregon's Every Student Belongs Law. And before joining the Department of Education, Amit spent nearly 25 years as a high school history teacher. Originally from Chicago, Amit now lives and bikes in Portland, Oregon. But Amit, if you just want to say a quick hi, tell us where you are now. You're actually not in Oregon. Yes, we. Um, hello, my name is Amit Kabrowski, and uh, right now I am in Walla Walla, Washington. So we took a quick trip out to this corner of the state, and it's beautiful, and I'm outside and leaves are falling, so it's great. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for being here and taking a little break to join us. Um, and last but not least for our, our panelists is Keisha Rembert, um, who is a lifelong learner and educator. And she's a doctoral student and an assistant professor of teacher preparation at National Louis University. So it's a teacher who teaches teachers, okay? Um, prior to entering teaching, uh, entering education, she spent more than I should, I should back up and say, prior to entering teacher education, she spent more than 15 years teaching middle school, English, and U.S. history in the Chicagoland area. Her passion for equity, social justice, and youth literature coalesce in her membership and work with several local and national organizations, and she is involved with a lot. Um, she, in 2021, she was appointed by Governor Pritzker to serve on the Illinois Holocaust and Genocide Commission. She serves on the advisory board of the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center at Center, center, and if you're wondering why a black woman is serving on the Holocaust Museum Board, she will tell you a little bit more later. <laughs> and the National Council for Teachers Education's Committee Against Racism and Bias member. Um, she is also the Gilder Lerman Institute for American History's Advisory Board member. And in, in 2019, Keisha was named Illinois History Teacher of the Year, as well as the 2019 National Council for Teachers of English Outstanding Middle Level English Educator. Um, so we are so excited that Keisha is here to share her experience and knowledge. Welcome, Keisha. I am so excited to be here with everyone today. We've got all the corners of the country like <laughs> represented, so I'm really excited. We have, and in our in our uh, attendees, I see we have, I think, every every time zone represented, including Hawaii. Uh, and so let's dive into our conversation. We have a lot to unpack here. I'm going to start off with Amit and Keisha. Um, as non-Asians, why do you feel teaching Asian American history is important? Who wants to take this one first? I can jump in. Um, I, I, I think Asian American history is American history. You know, you, you ask a teacher that and um, our, our history is made up of myriad stories and uh, history is just is a story in and of itself. So 
um, you're gonna get a little bit of my English and history teacher <laughs> philosophy here. But English, uh, history is story and really to exclude any one story leaves us incomplete and leaves the story incomplete. And it really is about understanding ourselves and our nation and our world. And uh, if, if we don't teach Asian American history, we ro really relegate identity and human connection. And it becomes an asterisk or a footnote in, uh, in, our, in our understanding. And, and that's really not what it is. Um, there's power in story and representation and hearing and seeing from the very perspectives of all who have come to the United States to um, create this beautiful mosaic that it is. And uh, really it, the, the teaching of Asian American history increases critical thinking and reduces bias. And we know more than ever now, we need that. We need that, um, that reduced bias and, and the reduced, um, to not see each other as different, but to draw connections among us. As a history teacher, I really believe it's my job to really create good citizens and for them to understand all the stories as, as a human did never. And that through that, we gain empathy and understanding and we ask questions about each other and we become our best selves. So I think that it essentially learning about Asian American history creates better Americans. I love that. Amit? I'm going to jump in and it just began to rain. This is a blood talk. So I'm going to talk quickly and then probably move locations here. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think what, what Keisha said is, uh, really puts it, um, a really good point on it is sort of the, the idea of, of what it creates for students and this idea of critical thinking. And as we you know, think about just all the different groups that we are now including in the historical narrative in our classroom, you know, I just think about history being much more than just an account of the past, right? It really gives context to you know, the present, but most importantly, like a map to the future. And we're thinking about the students kind of building that future. And so um, you know, we want students to be involved in a vibrant uh, education about the past, um, thinking about, about history, about social science in general, um, and all of that is towards this idea of like a pluralistic democracy. And, and what does that really mean? And, and, you know, are we really committed to that idea? And if, if we are committed to that idea, if we do want to continue this project of like, you know, a more perfect union. Um, it's important for students to understand this, the complexity of our national story and, and bringing in new voices, bringing in these sort of untold stories is part of that complexity. Um, and, you know, I think students are, are ready for those complex stories. We should talk about the importance of stories. Like, Students are ready for, for all of it. Um, and so we don't have to hide any history or you know, think about, are they ready for it developmentally? Are they ready for um, this story? So um, it's for those reasons that we have sought to bring in more sources, bring in more stories, bring in more um, different groups and individuals into our, into our history in the Oregon classrooms. And in Oregon, we have some, some really interesting local connections as well. We have you know, stories of Japanese incarceration. We have uh, the massacre of, of Chinese miners at, at Deep Creek uh, near Snake River. Um, and all of that is to say that we also have stories of, of sort of resilience and resistance uh, successes. And so we want to feature those stories as well. So it's not just sort of one kind of story that we're featuring for Asian Americans, but it's the full sort of experience of being in the United States. Yeah, no, very well put by both of you. Um, and I, I'm going to bring Kate into this because um, as Amit goes into a different location, that's not rain. Um, Kate, you know, you, you clearly work with the Asian American Education Project. Um, what, tell us a little bit more about, you know, your work and, and I guess how it is addressing some of this need that, you know, both of us and all, actually all of us have expressed of not learning this history growing up. Sure. Um... I mean, speaking from my personal experience, I was born and raised in San Diego, California, and, um, you know, had a relatively normal K through 12 education experience. And uh, I did my undergrad at UC Davis and my very first fall quarter as a freshman, um, I took an Asian American studies course um, with Dr. Hamamoto. And I remember being in a space with 500 other students who looked like me and were all kind of having this reckoning with our racial consciousness and learning all of these new 
we're relearning history essentially. And my mind is blown and I'm so confused because this is so new to me. And I, I remember in fifth grade, like going to the National Railroad Museum and seeing that big mural of the, of the golden spike. And, and there was no one that looked like me there. Um, and I've then since been told that apparently two years ago, local Chinese communities were able to rally for it to be updated. And so I'm looking forward to the opportunity to, to go back and visit um, the new railroad museum that accurately reflect, reflects history. In my own personal experience, what's been happening in the past few years is I've been having conversations with either current undergrads or um, people who have recently graduated. And though some time has passed in between, our stories are the same. All of our first points of exposure really start a little too late in college. Um, and so our, our goal at the project is to, to start this dialogue earlier. So we can, as Keisha was saying, you know, build awareness, build empathy, to learn how to think critically and remove biases um, that we all have early on. And so at the project right now, we currently have over 50 lesson plans um, that specifically are geared towards AAPI history, um, 36 of which are based directly on the PBS Asian Americans docuseries. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We still have a ton of stories that we want to amplify, a lot of local and national histories that reflect the, the whole AAPI community. Um, and so we're still, we're still building. Um, and what really what we're doing at the project right now is training teachers um, through free workshops. And you can find that on our website. Um, we're trying to share these resources with folks who are interested and for folks who want to learn more. It's not just for students or educators. It's truly anyone who's committed to relearning history. Um, these resources are here for you. Um, we're also um, working with districts, um, superintendents, uh, leadership at all levels. Um, to just get our resources in classrooms. Um, and it's, it's been a really interesting journey and it's been really um, empowering to know how many folks out there are committed to this. Um, and we're, we're excited to, to talk more about this throughout today. Yes, um, no, thanks for sharing about that. I know somebody just asked a question in the chat. Yes, we will be sharing a, a copy of this recording for those of you who have registered as well as some resources that are shared during this conversation. Um, and um, if you do have questions, um, we do encourage you to use the Q&A box. If you look on your screen on the bottom row, there is a specific box for Q&A. Um, if you could try to keep your questions in there, that would help us be able to and identify the questions easier when we come to our um, time where we have more open um, Q&A. Um, um, Keisha, I'm gonna come back to you, um, because I know in my introduction, I teased that you were on the advisory board of the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, why it was important for you um, to, for example, be on a, a board of something where naturally people wouldn't necessarily look at you and go like, why is she on that board? And and I and I say that to say because I know we have several people here on this conversation attending that are part of Asian American organizations. And you know, I want people to kind of think beyond like why it's important to bring in other allies to their organizations. Um, if you can speak to about your experience and your decision to join the board. Absolutely. I uh, a few uh, probably about seven years ago now, I went to the Holocaust Museum and I had gone there for a professional development a number of times, and um, I got a chance to listen to a survivor for the first time um, upon being there. And the survivor's story, um, as he was telling his story, I found myself in tears. And I found myself seeing points of his story intertwined with, the, with points of my parents' story. So here was this man who had survived um, and had, had fled his country and who had made uh, a way kind of out of no way. And um, I, I, as I heard him, all I could think about with my, were, were my parents and how incredible the human story is and how it flows from one person to another and um, how often our, our verses kind of connect. And I thought, you know what? Grace Lee Boggs um, stood up for people like my parents and um, was a revolutionary in her own right and put her, her thoughts and her mind to, to good use. And so why should I not? Um, it's a matter of understanding and empathy and, and really wanting to learn. If I'm being honest, it was like a selfish endeavor too because I wanted to learn more and I wanted to say um, that 
I was committed to learning and committed to never forget, right? So that that doesn't happen again because any atrocity con connects to me, right? It, 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 it affects my personage. And so um, when I think of what an ally is, to me, an ally, it, it's a lifelong process to be an ally. And it is a exercise in building trust and it's commitment and, it is, um, it, and it is not something that I can self-identify even, right? It's something that, that I want others to see in me. Um, I think recently I've, I've read a lot and I'm in love with um, Dr. Bettina Love, who's an educator and an author, and she talks about allyship and co-conspirators. And um, she uses this analogy of, um, Bree Newsome, who uh, climbed the flagpole in South Carolina to take the Confederate flag down. And she talked about um, James Tyson, who was there with her. They didn't know each other. They had just all decided that this was wrong and they, they were going to go together. And while Bree was climbing the pole, the police came and they were ready to tase the pole. And um, James uh, put his hand on the pole. Uh, as a white man and as a co-conspirator to say, I'm not gonna let this happen. And so I see my work at the Holocaust Museum as putting my hand on the pole and saying that I know that we are in an uptick of Holocaust deniers, that we are in, a, a, in an era where people, um, there was a st staggering statistic that uh, like some, I wanna say it was like, 60% of young people couldn't identify what the Holocaust was. And so I knew that I needed to be part of that change. Wow, Th thank you so much for just sharing your personal story. And um, I, you know, I, I wanna be able to like bottle up whatever you have Keisha and like pass it on to everybody else in the world, right? <laughs> Everyone who's watching, I think you would agree. <laughs> um, I mean, let's, let's move over to you and, and talking a little bit more about Oregon because, you know, allyship, um, you know, as, as Keisha so passionately expressed um, is a lifelong commitment. Um, and I know you working in the Department of Education, um, sometimes people have a personal commitment, but sometimes it takes some, some laws to, to kind of push people in that direction. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, Oregon's ethnic studies bill and kind of the plan um, to implement that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the law was really um, an effort, like a grassroots effort for the students. Uh, it started in the Portland metro area with kids who um, wanted to see, you know, something in the curriculum that reflected who they were, right? So, um, they went to their local school board and were asking for a class, a single class, uh, to be in their school, uh, in high school. And um, that ended up growing into what came down to Salem, which is our capital, and sort of it, it came into a legislative bill to, to bring some kind of ethnic studies standards um, into social science. And it was you know, sort of a small ask. It was sort of, um, it would be a recommendation originally uh, for social science to, to bring in ethnic studies concepts. Um, but what ended up growing from that piece, once the committee got together and we, uh, with our teachers um, who were really interested in uh, a set of standards, K-12, writing the social science standards that had just been passed in 2018. And so we came up with these new standards in 2021. It would have been faster except for COVID. Um, but when they came out in 2021, in February, um, they did kind of three things that are different than some of the other ethnic studies bills. There's, there's currently 12, I think, laws uh, in different states. Um, but I think Oregon remains with a unique approach. And so um, the first thing we said was um, that this is to include um, a wide range of groups. So not sort of the traditional four groups that are named in the uh, system. Instead, also include um, not only race, but also disability and religion, gender, sexual orientation, all of that would be part of the identities um, inside of our standards. The second piece was that um, these would truly be K-12. As I mentioned earlier, um, this is not you need to be 17 before we tell you the real history here. So this is starting in kindergarten, working with identities of students uh, who are in the classroom and just kind of working through the US history, other social sciences, uh, and talking about that from a very young age, that's their first year of school, uh, through high school. And then sort of related to that, piece is that unlike what where it sort of originally started, which was this idea of a single class, um, what we said was, in fact, it will not be a class. It will be integrated throughout the social science curriculum. 
So whether you take economics or geography or everybody takes U.S. history, world history, et cetera, um, you will have ethnic studies concepts integrated into your classroom. There will be no sort of ethnic studies standards and then everything else standards, right? It's just a full integration model. Um, and then if you want to have a class uh, in, at the high school level, you know, like sort of like a 200 level version of an ethnic study, then um, that's something we certainly um, support and encouraging schools to do. But this is the idea of, of sort of everybody having a baseline understanding that is uh, quite a bit different from uh, where we were coming from before. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I know when I saw you present, um, you know, in, in more in depth in, in this is that kind of your, I think it was like a five year plan or whatever, like where it is tagged as, you know, you said you're implementing the ethnic studies, but at some point, as you mentioned, it, you just pull the tag of ethnic studies, it just becomes integrated and part of whatever is being learned. Is that correct, Amit? Yeah, so um, so schools that are, there's kind of two options right now. You can go ahead and start using them at the beginning of the school year in 2021. Um, although because we had passed those standards in 2018 and schools had already committed textbooks and resources to the 2018 standards, we gave schools up until 2026 to sort of make that change, uh, which is our typical seven year cycle of, of social science adoption. So we, when we put it in and sort of thinking about the law um, that created the 2026 timeline, we thought most schools would, would wait till 2026, but we, we've seen over the last year and a half or so, schools really eager to jump in. Many schools have started, school districts, I should say, have started in 2021, um, with a lot of schools, districts getting ready for 2022. So we'll see. I mean, we're really excited about what we're seeing as far as how uh, eager school districts are to, to learn more and to try putting into the classroom. Can I ask no. a question? Sorry, sir. Go ahead, Keisha. Like, I'm really fascinated with the integrated model of that. And um, is that, do you feel like um, that is, um, presently we know that all kinds of curriculums, especially attached to history, are kind of under attack. And so does that integrated model better help to kind of insulate that type of instruction um, against kind of targeted attacks or people who just don't understand what that looks like? Um, I mean, we are hearing some of those same criticisms or attacks as well about what we're doing. And ethnic studies sometimes gets lumped in with other things that may or may not be happening in schools that are being accused of. Integration of the standards, I think, does, especially once they're sort of fully implemented, it, it just sort of embeds them into what we're doing. And so there won't, I mean, the idea is that there isn't even really um, like a unit, like, oh, we're going to study like you know, Asian Americans this week, and then we'll say something else next week. There's, there's really not that. And so we looked a lot at sort of um, like what happens with sex education um, and there was sort of sort of opt outs, right? And sort of those pieces. And we sort of wanted to avoid that as well, right? That this is somehow separate from what we're regularly doing. Like, as you said, and others have said, um, this history is American history. And so we wanted to like really live that out. Uh, by putting it into there and not saying, oh, this is this is some American history that you don't have to know. Like, that's not really an option the way the standards are built. Yeah, no, great questions. And, you know, um, I'm going to bring Kate into this conversation, too. And, and of course, we'll have Keisha comment as well. But um, Kate, I know you've been working with a lot of the different states on, on various AAPI and ethnic studies bills. Can you give a little bit um, more about, uh, give more background on some of the other things that you've seen happen um, and, you know, compare and contrast that a little bit? Sure. Um, so it's been so interesting getting to see what's happening in different parts of the nation with Oregon leading the way in 2017 and on and still continuing to and then Illinois with the TEACH Act um, this past summer um, in the state of Connecticut. What we passed was a K through eight model curriculum that included AAPI studies along with Native American studies as well. Um, and what we're learning is every state is different um, and the process is different and the local districts are different and the community partners are different as well. And so through our other Make Us Visible state chapters such as New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, Georgia and Florida, um, we're really learning how to activate communities and um, really giving the key stakeholders such as parents, students and teachers um, a platform and a voice to be able to share their stories and talk about why this is important. 
A um, lot of things are happening. New Jersey currently is campaigning for their bill um, specifically to highlight civic, contri uh, civic contributions of AAPI trailblazers. Um, and then Florida also just recently filed their bill, um, I think about a month ago um, in both the House, House and Senate, and they're busy um, securing support as well. And then Pennsylvania and Georgia, um, again, are busily um, building their coalitions, but also working from a different um, strategy where it's first engaging and activating the districts before proposing a bill. And so this is where the cool thing about all of this is you don't need the policy in place to get this started. If you don't want to start with a policy, because sometimes you know, as we can see from proposal to integration, full integration, that can take anywhere from two to five years, right? Um, but you can also start right, right at the grassroots level, you know, talk to your school, talk to your superintendent, uh, um, attend board of ed meetings, um, and just start from there. And so it's been really cool seeing what's happening. I know things are happening in Ohio, things are maybe starting in North Carolina as well. And this is where we're learning from each other's experiences and um, trying to help each other out by pushing all of these efforts forward. And then Keisha, as an educator of teachers, you know, how are all these, I guess, new bills and even just the approach to including more um, stories, um, you know, how, how do you approach that? And what is your response to all of that? Yeah, I'm really excited to be in Illinois where uh, in July we passed the Teaching Equitable Asian um, American Community History Act. Um, and also we had in back in March, we, and I worked on the policy for the culturally responsive teaching and leading standards for Illinois. So what I'm seeing is just kind of a wraparound, right? Where there's this understanding that um, all communities are, um, have contributions that should be taught in schools and um, while also giving educators the tools in which to teach them. Not only the tools in which to teach them, but the ability to look inwardly and to understand um, our own identities and, our, and the biases that we have and um, to then teach from a perspective uh, that, that doesn't include our biases. So what I'm finding is that my students don't know these histories, right? And it's hard to say, okay, now you have to go and teach something that you haven't learned. And so it is important for me as a teacher educator to make sure that I am bringing those, that history and those, those voices into the classroom and to teach teachers how to instruct. And I think Amit, Amit said it earlier, um, where you inc incorporate resistance and joy in all the myriad uh, perspectives that that history brings. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and to kind of, you know, keep the, the momentum going in terms of including you know, all these stories in this history beyond just the, the bills, like what what other stakeholders are involved and allies do we need to implement more of this, whether there's a bill or involved or not? How do you rally more allies? Um, who wants to tackle this one first? I'll just jump in quickly. I think, um, you know, what you discovered in Mississippi, there's these local museums sometimes that are, you know, sort of these hidden gems in these sometimes really small communities. We have many of them here in Oregon uh, that I've been finding as I, as I travel around the state talking about our standards uh, in small communities that there are these heritage centers. Um, and oftentimes they feature those sort of immigrant stories uh, that um, don't make it into the textbooks. And so those are, are always really good resources. Um, in a big city, you know, there's a number of community organizations um, that we've uh, leaned on to, to help us um, with specific like lesson plans or um, sort of that eyewitness testimony, uh, older generations who lived through a part of uh, Oregon history or Portland history that can be shared uh, from the Chinese American point of view, Japanese American, et cetera. Uh, so those uh, cultural centers have been really important as well. Um, and then it, it sort of, I think some of the theme of what we're talking about here is sort of thinking about allies beyond, you know, the group that's being talked about. Um, we also have a, um, a Holocaust museum uh, in Portland, um, and they have been really instrumental in not only elevating that history, but really uh, creating lessons for our teachers and, and uh, 
professional development for our teachers around ethnic studies in general. And so uh, they have really almost always been at something that ODE is co-hosting or ODE is promoting, something that they are, they are doing. So there's some other organizations that are already sort of filling this space. And I saw in the chat just this idea of what is, um, you know, what is ethnic history versus what is sort of American history. And, and many of these museums and heritage centers are sort of with the same thing, that this is all a shared history. I don't. I'd also love to add, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's about engaging the three key stakeholders, students, teachers, and parents, especially parents, especially after election day. Um, earlier this week, we're realizing parents have the agency to really affect a lot of ground level changes within education um, school districts. Um, one that comes to mind is the Backyard Caucus in Elmhurst, um, Illinois. It is a coalition of parents and communities that are really dedicated towards this cause, and they are a diverse group of folks who want to really come together and get the dialogue going to allow community members to come together. And so they, they um, together compiled something called Stories of Race in Elmhurst. I have a copy over here, and this is just their own testimony as to why all this work is so important, um, and they're able to highlight their truths. And through this, this is just one of several examples of how parent communities have come together to amplify each other's voices. Um, and it, it, it's really powerful. And I think it's scary sometimes if you don't know where to start. And it's really just, just start with one conversation with your neighbor. Just ask them for their story and start from there. Go to a museum together. Um, go on a walk together. F have everyone then invite another person and keep going. And um, it's the conversations that have been happening throughout the United States, and especially in the past year, have been nothing short of inspiring. Um, and so I encourage you all to take that little step to further activate your own community, however small or big it may be. I love that, Kate, because I, I think that it is about relationship building, right? And understanding through relationships. So it's about like going to coffee and understanding. I, I appreciate it during um, last summer when people just checked in on me and that I was able to broaden my circle in that way. And then I could do the same uh, earlier in the year when things were happening across the country with the AAPI community and being able to have a trusted um, comrade um, that you can talk to and, and also be there for, not necessarily lean on to learn everything, but um, to, to be in conversation with and to learn from, I think it's really important. Yeah, I think that's the the exchange of ideas and and entering one another's spaces, right? You know, I think sometimes we wait for, you know, an invitation, and sometimes, um, you know, it's a matter of um, a small gesture or, or caring and, and listening, you know, and and being interested in what someone else is doing. Um, now, I know we talked about some of the positives. Um, I'm sure um, there are some challenges to working with other groups, um, or even you know facing some opposition. Um, I know. Um, yeah, Meet and I talked about this when ethnic studies, um, you get some jostling between gr groups, right? Like how much of each group, um, Amit, how have you found um, you've dealt with, I think, having to try to balance and address um, some of these challenges with balancing different groups' interests? Yeah, I think it's one of the things with our integrated approach is we haven't in our standards like listed off you know, the five most important things to know about Asian American history or the five most important things to know about black history. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, is, is to sort of avoid the like, well, but you forgot about number six, right? And so that idea of sort of, you can't really balance things by, by counting a number, you're really looking for themes and concepts. And so our standards do that. Um, and what we've done is really encourage like sort of a, a, a sort of a standard amount of like knowledge and content about uh, and skills uh, for social science, um, but then also encourage teachers to think about who's in their classroom um, and where their community lies and you know where their school um, sits, um, and be reflective of that place as well, right? So if they have a, a Asian American population or if they're near um, whatever nine totally recognized tribal reservations, um, that they are creating a curriculum that's more inclusive of that local history as well, and who's in their classroom and the identities that are in that classroom. And so it's, it's sort of balancing it out in that way and sort of creating professional development opportunities so that teachers can see that. 
I mean, overall, the, the, as far as like group um, group dynamics or um, cultural organization or historical organization have been, um, you know, really willing to complement one, one another and support one another um, in this idea of, of um, creating curriculum, creating lessons, creating opportunities for, for people to learn each other's history in this more collective idea. So, so far, it's been, it's been a pretty good balance with that idea of sort of avoiding some of the known pitfalls that have happened in the, you know, in the past when we try to create, you know, here's one book that everybody should read and then what about this other book? So we, we try to give some more choice uh, for teachers and school districts around that. You know, the, the biggest thing is um, for us, especially with Make Us Visible is, is securing bipartisan support. And that means sometimes engaging in conversations that might be uncomfortable, um, but really just finding just trying to focus on finding the common ground. At the end of the day, we're, we're not trying to rewrite history, we're just trying to create a more comp complete version of history. And really it's, it's also just to protect our kids, for them to understand each other and to recognize that you are here, you are seen and heard and you, are, you belong. Um, and so in terms of obstacles, you know, there's, Sometimes some folks don't understand why this is important, and this is where you have to, you know, be patient and recognize that everyone has a really lived, different lived experience, and you have to take it, take this time to just breathe a little bit, and then just always remember to engage with an open mind and heart. Um, in terms of, I saw someone post in the chat about educators um, if they were open to the integration um, of curriculum, and if not, what were objections or hesitation, and then. In terms of that, what we're finding also is a potential challenge is just some educators really want to teach this, but don't feel confident enough because they weren't exposed to this. They don't know how to do this. And I think this is where a lot of training helps. Um, and it also, again, like for the teacher to be a student first and to learn it and realize it's okay to take that time to first learn it on your own before you are tasked with teaching your student. Um, and so I think this is where there are multiple organizations here ready along every step of the way to help scaffold that for folks. Yeah, and, and Keisha, anything to add on since you are a teacher of teachers at this point? Because that is definitely an area that, um, you know, we have seen even at our daughter's school that the teachers just, you know, even though our daughter goes to Mandarin Immersion School, her her teachers, a lot of them, majority of her Chinese, know more about Black history and Hispanic Heritage Month and, and you know, than they do about Asian American history. What challenges have you been seeing on as far as the teachers? Yeah, I would say that that's probably the biggest challenge that we saw from the poll, that we just, there's just not a lot of understanding of that history. And also there's a lot to unlearn, right? I think we often talk, talk about the things that we need to learn, but there's also some stuff that we need to unlearn. So we need to, uh, like, I was having a conversation with students and we were talking about um, Asian migration here to the United States. And, um, and I told them, I said, well, you, you, got, you know that uh, uh, Asian, were, Asians were here before uh, the, this mass uh, movement to Ellis Island, right? And their eyes got big and they just didn't, they, you know, they were of the opinion of this perpetual foreigner concept. And we just, we, we had, there's some stuff that you have to debunk too and unlearn in order, in order to effectively be a teacher. And so I think that that's going to be, uh, I think it speaks to Kate's point of just some learning has to be done. And, and, and I know that uh, in my state, that's the major task now. The next thing is to ensure that teachers um, have ample learning and training themselves so that they also do no harm. Right. So there might be a tendency to to jump in and like get really excited without um, without fully understanding and without being able to give full stories. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely um, a lot of room to grow um, in this area and a lot of work that needs to be done from what we've all shared. We are getting a lot of questions coming into the Q&A chat box. Um, for those of you who have been putting some questions in the chat, um, if you could try to also ask your, if you could also put your question in the Q&A box, um, there's a little button on the bottom row, um, just so that's easier for us to filter out the questions. We're gonna get to the questions um, in, in a bit, um, but I do wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, 
some best practices for for people watching here we have a, a very mixed group of people we have educators out in the audience we have people who are community members some people that are parents um, people that are activists people that are business owners um and talk a little talking a little bit about bringing allies together um one of the things that i've um you know we've done with our film um in terms of um trying to activate people um is we realize that um as some of you have mentioned it's like a, parents do have a lot of the say um they are part of the community and asking you know for some of these changes to happen um, or to be able to support or even in some case resist some of these changes right um, and so you know one of the things we've done is we've worked with a lot of employee resource groups at companies because we know a lot of employees are parents and we've been able to screen our film we brought together um, you know Asian American employee groups black employee resource groups together so that you have kind of these natural connections and you know, these allyship allies ships built and so all of a sudden like people are sharing a space and going how can i help share your story you know where sometimes it's like we only hear about you know just the asian side or we just hear about the black story and you know finding those points of connection um and you know we've done the same thing at different universities and bringing different departments together the asian american studies department the african american studies department um what are some other um, ways that suggestions you have uh, for the audience here um, in terms of how they can build better, you know, allyships and, and other spaces they can do to kind of activate their community to see Asian American history brought to more schools? I would say just as a, as a teacher, I'm a big proponent uh, as a parent when I didn't see my child represented in like their school, I bought books and I went and I read books to the classroom and um, I uh like the for the people who didn't know who uh the people there are, there are a number of picture books about Wong uh Art Kim and there and and so there that's a way to also build understanding and also bring organizations into community spaces so like bringing in someone from the AAPI community into a school and developing that partnership, like that's then lasting, right? Me leaving that picture book in the classroom, that's lasting, that's gonna spark conversation, that's gonna spark inquiry, that's gonna maybe motivate students to go home and talk or teachers to continue uh, to talk to one another. And I think it's just, a, a, it's that simple for me. And, and I know that's, a, but that's a very basic level of kind of starting that dialogue and continuing to build. You know, before we get to all the Q and A's, um, I did want to share with people um, uh, one of the things that we're doing um, with Far East Deep South is we launched something called the First Class Initiative because we know one of the other challenges that a lot of schools have is budgets. And you know, like, well, how are we going to get all these new materials and how are we going to get all these new resources to bring in to teach this stuff? And so um, we launched something called the First Class Initiative where. Um, Teachers can apply to our first class initiative fund to bring our film, Far East Deep South, into their schools for the first time and show it to their class. Um, and um, that's something we'll drop a link um, and we're gonna be sharing some slides as well with that. Um, and we've also developed a discussion guide because again, we know that teachers are like, I don't know anything about the Chinese in the Mississippi Delta, or I bet, you know, and I don't know a whole lot about the Chinese. Do you think there will ever be federal legislation on ethnic studies, or is this something in the pipeline? Kate, do you have a sure. response? To that? I I hope so. I hope so, and it's also depending on a lot of things right now. Right, um, with the hope is to activate enough states, and so then we can all coordinate and um, and pull something off federally. Something in terms of federal education um, studies, it's. Um, it is tough because education in the United States is so decentralized that we really want to think about how to intentionally um, move forward with these. Um, I do know there have been attempts, um, but I long way of saying, yes, I do hope so in the future. I think this, this relies on all states, or not all, at least um, um, a solid amount um, to get together and coordinate. And I think that actually is a long-term vision of make us visible maybe take the other side of that a little bit in, in that it's it, um, we don't have any kind of federal um, federal standards for social science. Um, it's very hard. We don't have a national test. Um, so we're missing some of those pieces. And um, but what's happening in this at the state level is really exciting and that many states are sort of taking this up. 
and um, it's not just the typical states like you know people would expect maybe California and Oregon and, and New Jersey and et cetera to sort of take these on, but we're seeing some movement in um, you know traditional Southern states, for instance, um, that are bringing in some, some ideas around ethnic studies or specifically like black history, et cetera. But I think what like a strategy to think about is that in many of those um, states that maybe don't have an ethnic studies bill pending, um, they often use a, a textbook adoption process in which the entire state adopts from a very small list of textbooks. And so working with those textbook publishers about you know, what is Oregon expecting to see in their textbooks, what is California looking to see, uh, New York, New Jersey, et cetera, changes, you know, creates a more um, dynamic and inclusive um, history um, that then moves to educate the teachers, to, to educate um, to, to educate the students around just the materials that they're, they're getting, right? Those kind of main textbook materials. So even without absent federal legislation, uh, which might be far away, um, there are ways to sort of think about how to impact the entire country with, uh, with ethnic studies or with um, just a more inclusive history, whether it's called ethnic studies or not, just thinking about a history that reflects who's in our classrooms. Charles had a question from your teaching experiences. How do you organize execute and organize execute your curriculum to empower your minority students to gain the cultural confidence to succeed as other students, in addition to helping them connect with their international peers from their ancestral ethnic countries. Mm. So I actually am not a history teacher. Um, my, I am a middle school Mandarin teacher. And so as a world languages teacher for me, it's really always looking for opportunities to to allow for all students to feel seen and i think this is where for example one of my favorite things to do is approaching teaching a language through the cultural iceberg where we know that usually what people know is the stuff on the top like your holidays what are you going to wear all this stuff but really in the background the bigger parts of it are traditions values these things and this is where i really like to bring in the stories of the the stories of what our students know um, from various backgrounds. Um, when you write a letter, the envelope, um, you know, what goes first? Is it the name first, depending on where you are, or is it the country first? Um, and what does that signify, right? And I think a lot of teachers, what they try to do is to not keep their curriculum focused on one source. They try to bring in a ton of resources with a ton of um, information spanning all sorts of timelines um, just to try for students to see where points of intersection happen and that all of history is interconnected and this you can weave that through world languages you could do it through art through English um, even math and stem um, oh Keisha hi good to see you <laughs> um, Keisha so, made it back <laughs> yeah I hope that helps um, I think it was Charles who asked that question yeah, Keisha, we just somebody just asked a question about how, from your teaching experiences, how do you organize, execute your curriculum to empower minority students to gain cultural confidence to succeed as other students, in addition to helping them connect with their international peers from their ancestral ethnic countries? Wow. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> a huge question. Can I take a stab at it? Sure, because yeah, I figured you'd have an answer. I was hoping you'd come back on. <laughs> um, I think, uh, and I've just written about this, I think it's starting from a place of, of, at the beginning, starting from a place of joy, right? Like I never teach from a place of pain or from a place of erasure, or um, I always start from uh, a point of joy and then um, building from that. And, and, and always thinking about, like there's this, I think uh, Amit said it earlier, we tend to um, want to only teach certain parts of it and, and history is complicated and history is um, it's messy and students are ready for that messy part um, and really delving into the causes and effects and the intersectionalities of that and so it might not just might not be starting from if I if I'm teaching um, the transatlantic um, railroad. I'm not starting when the Chinese came to America. I'm starting with um, the Chinese in China and the reason that um, the reason that they were leaving 
um, their place of origin. And so I'm looking at all of those things and, and the conditions there. And, and then that's a connection back, right? That's a connection that students can make back to their ancestral homeland. And, um, and also bringing in organizations. I, I'm also not a historian on every matter. So again, there's some learning and some unlearning that I'm constantly having to do. So I think partnerships are important in building um, understanding in a classroom and so that people can hear from many voices that aren't just mine. Just to add one, I just realized one of my favorite examples for allowing students to realize we need to engage with multiple perspectives is just the concept of a, of a map of the world. Um, I often love to unveil the maps that we use that I've collected from parts of Asia and Russia where they realize, whoa, hold on, this is not the world map I'm used to, but yet it's the same thing. What does this mean? And so when they see that, you know, the continents feel almost reversed, they realize, oh, wow, like you have to look at things from different perspectives. And so we try to channel that through different cultures, different historical timelines. Who's saying the story? you know, um, whose history is being shared through whose, what lenses. And um, from fifth grade onwards, and even earlier, those are pretty concrete examples for students to kind of embed in their, um, in their foundation. No, those are, are really great um, perspectives. Um, we're gonna do one last question and I'm gonna give all of you a final word um, for each of our panelists. Um, we really appreciate those of you who have hung in through all the technical issues. Um, thank you for extending grace and patience to us. I know all of you are probably going like, what happened? And, um, you know, we really appreciate you joining this conversation. And um, we are going to splice together what video, hopefully we were able to preserve the video that was recorded. Um, okay, Baldwin gives me a thumbs up that yes, it was being preserved. Um, and uh, I know we may or may not have gotten all of the chat, but whatever resources were shared, um, we will try to drop those links into the emails um, that and send you an email with some of those resources that will called um and this is from our fellow filmmaker robin lung who directed a, a, a wonderful film called finding kukan um what are the some ways that film producers can connect with high school curriculum creators and teachers to alert them about historical themes in their films that might connect to their lessons plans yeah there's something called um open educational resources which in oregon we have something called oregon open learning uh, but it's a consortium of several states uh, that hosts, um, you know, sometimes it's lesson plans, sometimes it's, it's film, um, and they can be sort of created by teachers or in the case of a film that's already produced, a link to a film. Um, and then teachers can watch the film, upload their own lesson plan that they created from the film, or if the film uh, comes with lesson plan or comes with discussion questions, whatever level of sort of interaction the, the film has with curriculum that can also be hosted on, on the open learning site. And so the OER is, um, like I said, it's a national um, website. Uh, it just has to be Creative Commons licensed, um, or obviously if it's the, the director or the creator of the material can, can give permission for it to be used in a classroom. Yeah, I think finding students where they are um, um, is, is really powerful. So if there's a way to just include clips on TikTok. And I know this sounds really um, like I, I'm sounding really boomerish here, but um, being able to share things on TikTok with questions. And I know that um, there was, uh, for the Holocaust Museum, there was a Instagram created of one of the survivors and it told her story through Instagram. And my students were immediately drawn to that and wanted to explore that more um, because it was a medium with which they were familiar. And it was a really accessible way for me to bring it and introduce it to the classroom. And then they were begging me to read the entire story then because um, they had been introduced it, to it in, in a way that was familiar and comfortable for them. I had been holding off on doing anything on TikTok. So after you said that, I may, I people, I was like, ah, oh, do we put any clips on TikTok of our film? But yes, I guess, you know, some people, consume that information now in, and in that regard. TikTok is huge. My students told, I don't know, but my students have told me 
teacher TikTok and I'm like, okay, do I even want to go? And they're like, no, we <laughs> promise you. It's a good, it's good. It's not bad. So. All right. I may join teacher TikTok and explore that world <laughs> next. Um, I want to thank um, all our panelists once again. I'm going to give everybody kind of a final word. And, and again, apologies again for the technical issues. Um, it, it was such a rich and lovely conversation that we'll, I feel like we'll have to gather you all again and, and do this again. Um, but, um, you know, final words, um, um, advice or, or anything else that you didn't get to share before we got cut off. Um, Amit, um, I'll start with you since I know you had the most technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, and, and yes, I apologize. Um, yeah, I think just, you know, one thing I, I just, if people have not yet seen it, Far East Deep South is just a wonderful film. Um, I think that's really you know, I watched it as soon as you sent me the link and um, and just immediately contacted you, I think, right after watching it because it was so moving, um, not just about um, American history or, or Chinese American history, but really just that was very important and new information for me, but also just the, the human connection and the, the, the father, son, grandfather story, um, just amazing. So uh, if you haven't seen the film, I really recommend that and try to get it into your, your, the hands of your teachers at your local level. Uh, it's great. Um, and then I think it just as, as thinking about um, policy changes or, or how to make this happen, and um, it's just really asking teachers or working with teachers to, to, to have teachers ask that question about, is the history they're teaching reflective of who's in their classroom? Um, and I think our teachers, as we've talked about today, they, they almost always want to do the right thing. They want to be inclusive. They don't always know, know how um, because they don't necessarily have the background in, in this stuff, but they are uh, often willing to learn. But it, it's sort of that eye-opening experience of realizing that what you're teaching maybe is not reflective of who's in your classroom. And so when they're asked that question, um, I think that changes everything for, for, for many teachers. And so I just, you know, engage your teachers in that conversation. And oftentimes, and this was the case for my own teaching when I was in the classroom, um, it's that student voice, the student saying, what about my history um, and suddenly they're just like oh yeah this is um, a total mess so um, listen to student voice and, and then engage with teachers is sort of my advice thanks Amit and and uh, by the way I did not pay him to say that about Far East Deep South and it was not a condition of him joining the panel to say good things about our film but thank you Amit for the plug um, Kate um, last comments words suggestions Sure, I absolutely echo it. I mean, it was when I first watched it, I didn't know what to expect. And I remember going to the history department of my school the next day being like, oh my gosh, my mind is blown. We have to talk about this. History is truly intersectional and we need to show this. Like, da 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 da. And I think um, some colleagues were like, okay, Kate's having um, an interesting day. But point being, it's powerful um, the power of storytelling and learning our own history that transcends generations. And I think, please watch it. Um, it's so good. It'll start a bunch of conversations for sure. If, if anything, a conversation with yourself too. Um, my few last seconds, um, if anything today sparked an interest, um, I know we touched upon a bunch of things. I know I wear many hats, but if you want to learn more about the project, the educational resources, how you can get involved in helping designing curriculum. If you wanna talk about how to start a coalition or policy or how to draft a bill, or if you don't want any of that, but you're just like, I kind of just wanna talk to you more, um, please email me, we'll set something up. I'm happy to be there. Um, and also a um, shameless plug for Asian American Education Project's uh, Instagram account. Please follow um, and spread the word and we appreciate any love and attention. Thank you so much. Yeah, and another resource I was gonna say, you also sit on the, the board of uh, Immigrant History Initiative, so. Uh, Yes, uh, they're an incredible resource as well. They're um, starting something really cool um, in terms of training parents um, about this stuff too, how to engage in discussions about AAPI identity and that journey with um, children. So that too, please be in touch if you're interested in learning more. Um, I'll also drop their website in the chat as well. Great, and Keisha, um, last words, suggestions, resources you'd like to share? Thank you. Kate, that's amazing because that's a resource I use in my classroom all the time. So yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to uh, see a face to go with that. Um, let me just start by saying um, about the film. So I am the daughter of 
uh, Mississippi migrants. And um, so being able to see the film and being able to see Greenville, Mississippi, which my father grew up right down the road from, and um, to be able to hear that like Cleveland is my mother's place where, uh, where she was, where she grew up. It's like, it's crazy to have that connection and also to not know that history, right? Like that's, that's wild to me that my parents grew up there and yet I didn't know that history. So thank you for that, um, Baldwin and Larissa. Um, I would say that it's really important to just expand your community, to really just expand your community, to um, get outside the box and learn and build community with others so that you can create change. And change is incremental, right? Change just can happen with a cup of coffee. Change can happen with the sharing of a book or the sharing of a smile. And um, you can move from there. And I think that, that we, can, we can change the world in that way. Um, and that we never, we never allow no's to stop us. <laughs> we, we work until we get the yes. I love that. Um, I'm just going to like bottle up all of your quotes, uh, you know, Kate, Amit, Keisha, um, you've, you've all three of you have um, just been remarkable in, in this conversation. And, um, you know, we, we hope again to continue this conversation, because um, I know there's so much more to talk about that we didn't have time to tackle today, and especially with their technical issues. And um, we want to thank everyone who, um, you know, was able to join us back on and those of you who are watching the replay again we apologize if you're one of the people that we lost along the way during this conversation because of technical issues um but we are you know so so grateful um for all of you for being here just to let you know um i think baldwin there was a slide if you're interested in seeing our film there are a few events coming up um that are I mentioned Cinequest is playing our film right now. If you're in the San Diego area, um, I think there was one person, I don't know if they're still here. Uh, we're going to be at the Coronado Island Film Festival in person um, on November 11th. Um, Cine Odyssey is actually, I think, in North Carolina. They're going to do some a, a hybrid of, I think, virtual and um, in person. Um, and if you're in Milford, Michigan, they're going to be screening our film finding, at the Finding Home Film Festival at the Milford Cinema. Um, so that those are your next opportunities to watch our film. And I'll just do a plug for our, our educational distributor. Um, we have an um, array of educational films that reflect so many different perspectives and reflect the way people look in classrooms um, at New Day Films. Anyway, we appreciate you again, once again, and to all our panelists. Um, and um, we hope to see you at one of our future events. Um, we plan to do more in this series. So please stay tuned um, because, you know, we we have a lot of work to do. As we've mentioned here, there's still a lot of schools that need to include this history and a lot of people that we need to win over. Um, so we all need to do this together. So thank Thank you for all for being allies and um, we wish you a very good night. Thank you.